Now, so the exciting thing about this is it's what we already know, right? I want to first say thank you guys for being here. Thank you for allowing me to come up like this. My name is Damon Hopkins, and for those of you that are at home on the computers and stuff, thank you. Everybody here is an absolute answer to prayer. Everybody at home, you're an answer to prayer as well. Thank you for, for tuning in. I definitely want to encourage each and every one of you that in this message is the truth. Christ loves you all, and he wants you to know that he has done the work for you. Amen? Um, my name is Damon Hopkins. I have pastored probably for about... 22 years, um, mostly for the Salvation Army, um, some with the Baptist Church, and uh, big surprise, right? Um, <laughs> so sometimes with the Foursquare Church, just really been watching God work through me and watching God be a God of seasons. Well, in this season, I'm here with you. Hallelujah. I, I'm just so excited because this is the first message that, that uh, Pastor Alex has allowed me to teach. There is no, I, I hate to say, there's no better message. <laughs> this one is great. Sometimes when you go to war, you have too much firepower. This is too much firepower. And, the, and Pastor Ali said, you have about 20 minutes. Can we start the clock? Oh, it's up there. Okay, because I will. <laughs> what I love about this is we have a God that not only asks us to honor and worship him, but he's a God that did the work for us. Amen. We have a, uh, a chart that we're going to put up on the, on the board, and it is literally of a number of different belief systems, as you guys can see them. We have Mormonism up here. We have um, Islam. We have Judaism. We have Buddhism. And we have Christianity. These are some of the biggest religions the world knows right now. But the truth of the matter, the reason I put it up, one, it's on the back of your sheets that you guys have. You guys all have one. What this is, is for you to go home and read and get to know. Because the truth of the matter is, these are the people that you're going to be talking to, along with the world that doesn't know him at all. And you have confidence with this to know that Christ, unlike any of the other religions, has done all the work for you. Your job is to believe. To believe. Has Christ not only done the work for you, but he's actually gone and prepared a place for you. He's not telling you to do a bunch of stuff. He's not saying, do this, do this, do this, and you'll be accepted. Nah, Christ said, I've accepted you by dying on the cross for you. I have a saying, and that is, I respect every man. I respect every man not because of what he's done, but because of what Christ has done for him. You have my respect because Christ died on the cross for you already. He died on the cross for you and me. So I respect you from there. Now, trust is another story, but respect you have with me. I'm not going to tell you you have to earn my respect. The world tells you you have to earn somebody's respect, but you know what? Christ did that. Christ died for you already, so I can't not respect you. I must respect you because Christ did. And because I respect you, I want to give you the truth of Christ Jesus. I love that. Now, my favorite ministry in the world is evangelism. I love doing that. Now, Alex has given me kind of a sermon outline. And God bless him for it because I like learning new things, but it's also to keep me focused. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Alex. So I have, of course, the opportunity to do that, but at the same time, give you the word of God you know, in the way I love it. So looking at these up here, we realize that there are different things that are being said here. We know Christianity. We know that one well. Islam, not, not so much, but I mean, it's just a bit different. But remember, when you look at this, this is where Christ does the work for you. And I love that. Our job is to believe. To believe. And that blesses my heart to, think, to, to believe. Our first point today is Jesus is the only way to the Father. Amen? Amen? He's not a way. He's not kind of part of the way. He's the way, the only way. And I think that it's great because Christ shows us this in trouble, in complete and utter trouble. Because we see in Matthew 23 where Jesus is in, the, uh, in, Mount, um, in, in Gethsemane, excuse me, after he's explained to the men several times in Matthew 16, he said to the men that the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, 
and then be born again, to be raised again. And you see, Peter stops and says, Jesus, no, we're not going to let this happen to you. See, the funny thing about Peter, he's like me. He's like all of us, really, but he's like me in this sense that I want to save Jesus. But I, Jesus is supposed to save me. I, I, I can't save him. I can't get him to the Father. He's going to get me to the Father, much like Peter. Jesus, we're not going to let this happen. We're going to do whatever we can to keep you from being betrayed into the hands of sinful men. What did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. You do not have the things of God in mind, but the things of men. I feel bad if I was Peter because I'm a very sensitive person. But dang, Jesus, I just love you, man. That's all. I'm just loving you. But Christ is calling out the problem. Not Peter, but the problem. See, we want to do the things we can do to make things better. But you have to realize Christ is the better. He is the only way. See, Peter wanted to be the way right there. Peter's like, I'm going to take care of you. No, Peter's like, Jesus like, no, you can't get me there. I will get you there. If you stop me, then you will not get there. I'll be honest with you for a minute. I can't leave the stage. I don't want to leave the stage and walk around. I'll be honest with you for a minute. I, I, I would come for you guys. I love every one of you. I respect every one of you, like I was saying before. So I want to come and save you. But Christ knows I can't do that. Because as soon as they bring the whip out, I'm done. I'll talk big and I'll tell you the great stuff and I'll do all this. But then the whip comes out and it's like, you know what? I, I, I'm, I, I'll see you all later. I'm just going to go. What's great about Christ is he stood firm in the midst of it all. What guy has done that? What God tells you that he's the truth and then, and then goes to a whip? Turns a cross uphill. Dies on that cross. Stands firm until the end. Saves a man, unvengeful, saves a man at the last moment of, of, of the crucifixion. What God has done that? I, I hear you, Islam has this, and all the other religions have this, that, and the other thing. They have this great, powerful God, but our God became the least of us. Our God took on the form of a man and did the things we could not do, things we'd be embarrassed by, things we'd be disrespected by. He did it. I'm talking that God. He tells Peter, get behind me, Satan, because he knows that if you, stop, if you continue, Peter, I may not finish this. I got to finish this. I got to do this. So he stands firm. All the way through to the end. Then it, and he says it again when, he, when he's washing their feet. He goes to Gustav and he says, The time for your son to glorify his father is upon us. And he says, my, my heart has become sorrowful to the point of death. Stay here while I go up on the mountaintop and pray. Which is normal for Jesus. It's not, he didn't get into the middle of the trouble and start praying. He prayed every day, it seemed to us. He'd be saving souls in Mark 2, and then he'd go on the hill and pray in the middle of it. He prayed all the time. It was almost like he had a formula. God first, then the disciples, then the world. I go to God, find out what God wants. I come down off the hill. I tell the disciples what God wants, and then we go into the city, and we tell the people what God wants. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. We could do that, right? We don't always, but we could do that. So, as Christ is literally on this hill, it, the word tells us that he, he falls on his face as he goes up further, and he begins to sweat pools of blood, it sounds like. And then he makes a plea. This, he makes a plea. He's, he almost seems to be like a different Jesus. Now, I know Jesus did all these, these great things for me, and it's a great story, but when I see the emotion of Christ Jesus in his garden, I realize he's a lot like me. Because he says, Father God, if you will take this cup away from me, not my will, yours be done. Let me give you Damon's version of that. Father God, if there's any other way that they can know you, if Mormonism worked, let that be one way. If Jehovah's Witness worked, if any of the 150,000 religions worked, Lord God, let that be the way. Let one of them just be a way. Because then I don't have to die on the cross. Not that Jesus was a coward, he wasn't. He was real like us. And I love him more in this point than ever. Because it's what I would say. Father God, look, can I bargain with you a little bit here? Because I know I didn't say all that. And I know I was going to do this. But uh, let, let's rethink this, huh, God? I know I said God used me, but I feel a little used right now. I know, God, I sat in the middle of church camp and I said, Father God, use me. And I know I'm sitting in my bed right now going, God, I feel so used. <laughs> know that we have moments. And Christ shared a big one with us. 
God, thank you, Jesus. Because I needed that to come to Christ myself. So, you could say, Damon, that's not really what ha happened. Okay, I, okay, I hear you. But let's go a little bit further. Christ is in the garden. He's asking God for another way. The word says God says nothing. Christ comes down off the mountain. Here's what I love. Here's the truth to me. He's a different Jesus here. Here's what he says to, to, to the disciples. Could you not keep watch one hour while I go up on the mountaintop and pray? He's frustrated because there's no other way. He wanted there to be another way, and there wasn't. So we see a different Jesus. If there's any other way, Father God, no, shoot. Goes back down to the hill. Could you not keep watch even for one hour while I go up on the hill and pray? I can imagine Peter jumping up, because you know Peter. Uh, we were tired from the trip, Jesus, so, you know, it was really tiring, and we had our, our whole thing, and it was, you know, tired. And what did Jesus say? He comes back and he says, watch and pray. Because even though your spirit is willing, your flesh is weak. And I would believe that Jesus' flesh was a little weak at that moment because he was up there trying, not, trying to get off the cross before he got on the cross. Not that he's a coward. He's our Christ. He knew what had to happen. But it is real for him. <laughs> it's very real this moment. So then he goes back up on the hill to pray again. The word says the same prayer. No answer. <laughs> now, I know you guys pray to God and sometimes don't feel you get an answer. So come on, come on, do this with me. Oh, God, he didn't hear me. He didn't hear me. He hears you. Sometimes the answer is just no. My plan says I'm going to do it this way, son. I love you and I love giving you everything. That, but no right now. No. No is okay. No is good for God. Because we have to stand firm in this situation. We can't get out of it. I hurt my behind last week. It hurt really bad. And I said, God, take this pain away. It hurts. No. No. Not until Thursday. <laughs> and I didn't understand why. I want to tell you there's this great story that goes along with it, but I don't know the end of it yet. It stopped hurting on Thursday, but God's answer to me was no. As silly as that is, it's just what, it's part of God's thing. You know, I had parents. They were great parents. You'll hear a little more about them later. But the truth of the matter is, they said no a lot. And I was thankful for it later on because I got it then. I didn't get it at the time. My parents hate me. I don't like them either. That even be a bedtime story. <laughs> I didn't like them when they said no to me. But you know what? They said no for a reason. Daddy, can I drink that? No. Why? It's alcohol. It'll make you sick. Well, you guys get to drink it. I don't understand. We're your parents. We can, we're grown-ups. We can drink it. I don't understand. You won't even like it anyway. You always say that. They were always right. Because they weren't looking. I took a sip, and I threw up on the table. And I had to clean it up. I never took another drink again. Not that I'm against alcohol, I'm not. It's just my parents knew that if, if I drank it, my dad, my dad he, he, he's funny. He would do it just while I learned the lesson. He'd say, yeah, go ahead, drink it, son. Drink as much as you want. And I'd drink, <laughs> I get sick, and he'd go, want some more? My mother's like, no, no, we're not doing that to him. No, the answer is no. And, you know, and my dad would have to go along because dad would listen. You know, my father's funny. He's the guy that will sit at the table and look at my sister and me and go, now look, this is how it is. Let me tell you one thing right now. I'm man of this house. You listen to what I tell you because that's what's going to happen. <laughs> Daddy, what you looking for? Mom says, me. <laughs> he was the man of the house. Anyway, back to it. So Christ comes down off the hill, and he is frustrated. And he says, could you not keep watch for an hour? And then, of course, when the men start, I, I think, making excuses, he says, look, just know that your heart is weak. Know that your flesh is very weak, but your heart it loves me. I know that, but your flesh is weak. So be careful. Go back up on the hill, he prays again, same prayer, nothing. Comes back down off the hill, the men are asleep again. Which is kind of a commentary on how we are as people. We tend to just, we, 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 fall, we fall asleep pretty easily. And then he goes back on the hill a third time and prays the same prayer again, and guess what? No answer. Comes down off the hill again and, and, and says, okay, well, my, my moment is at hand, you know, men are coming. They come, Peter, God bless him. He blew it three times, right? 
Not, I'm not talking about the time when he disowned his own Christ. I'm talking about the time that he fell asleep on him all, all these times. The word tells he jumps up. The guy goes to arrest Jesus and he cuts his ear off. And Christ says, Christ heals the ear immediately. And he says, Peter, do you not realize that those who live by the sword die by the sword? It's not about you fighting for me to, you know, to be safe. It's about letting things happen the way God wants them so that he can save all of you. I would not know that at the time because I hadn't seen it yet. So I give some grace to Peter in that one. So then Peter literally does this and Jesus heals the ear, tells him that. But the thing that blesses me is that he, Jesus says, do you not realize, Peter, that I could send more than two legions of angels to come and rescue me right now? But if I did, how could the scriptures be fulfilled that say that it must happen this way? See, because he's talking about the book, the book of, of Isaiah, where it says that he's, going to, that, that, that he's going to grow up among us like a bitter root, right? Like, like, like his blood's going to cleanse our sins and heal our wounds. See, the Old Testament is telling us of Christ coming and doing these things and dying this specific way. And Christ wants that to be true, and he wants us to be saved. So his word says, I can be in right and say, Peter, I can leave now. But I'm not going to do that because I want the scriptures to be correct. I want what the Bible says to be right, and I want you to be with me in heaven. If I leave now, you ain't going to heaven. So then he literally goes with them, and the worst happens. The whippings, the beatings, the, the, the carrying the cross up here, which is a sermon in itself. The dying on the cross, the saving of people, it all happened that way. But because Christ said this, he told us also that he's the only way to the Father. He knows us by experience. He knows us because he's God. And he knows us because it's the truth. Jesus is the only way to the Father. He wanted there to be another way. In the garden you could see that. But there was no other way. This is God's plan. This is what God wants. Amen? So what's, what's, what's Peter, what, what is Jesus' job to do then? Follow. Well, if God says no, it means i got to follow. Many of us as human beings, I was watching God's Not Dead this week. Many of us as human beings love to get angry at God because he says no. And we get that. We've been kids before. We understand that. But the other side of that is you can run the other direction. You can be mad at God. You can launch this whole campaign against God. Anybody in my classroom that says that Jesus is alive, you don't get to come, you get an F in my class. So you can turn around and do all these terrible things because you're mad at God. But you have to realize that without God's plan, there is no plan. It's run amok. It's, it's, it's anarchy. It's a mess. And there's nowhere to go. But with God, this, as bad as it could possibly get on this world, is bad with God... There's eternity. There's always hope. There's encouragement. But we as humans must do our part. Let's look for it. Look for that. It's important. Okay. Now, second point. Through God, we get the Holy Spirit. Amen? So not only does God do the work for us, but he also gives us the Spirit to go along with us. I like that. In the Bible, he sent the men off by twos, right? He said he sent the disciples off by twos. They were never alone. And with Christ, we're never alone. Because we have him, we have the Holy Spirit with us. We just have to acknowledge it, church. We've got to acknowledge the Spirit with us. You know, I tell the kids, when we're in that store, we see that, that, that nice video game CD right there, and we know it's, the, the, the box is open. Do we grab that CD and move on? Or do we see the Spirit saying, don't you touch that, you know better. And the kids laugh. They go, oh, just grab the CD and run. It's like, it's okay, but think, think this through now. God is also a just God. Every kid that, that my youth group class has ever done something like that gets caught. <laughs> and that's because of God. You know, they, they, they'll, they'll have a quick escape. They'll grab it. They'll run. They'll trip and fall. They'll only trip and fall with the CD. You'll fly out of their hands in front of the checker. <laughs> Unpaid for it. <laughs> I told the kids, you do, that, you do that now with the Lord, it'll probably happen to you. They don't do that anymore. But the Lord tells us we have the Spirit. We have the Spirit. The Word calls it an advocate, another advocate, because Christ is our advocate, but we have another advocate with that Spirit. Amen? I love that. <clears throat> All right. So here's what it says. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you an advocate, another advocate to help you, and be with you forever. I love that. And it's, it's the NIV. 
He will give you another advocate that will be with you forever. I love that. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because he it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be with you in you. Now, we can say advocate. We can say comforter. We can say helper. All three work. All three work. I just keep saying go God because you know what? We could be in this world by ourselves trying to do God's work. It's hard. But God knows the multitude of our work. He knows the multitude of what we have to do. He's the one who tells us to pick up your cross and bear daily. What is Christ saying? He's quantifying the fact that your trouble is as big as his was. <laughs> we all know it isn't. We all know that, you know, wanting to do this and not being able to do it is a lot different than being whipped on a cross. Being, having, having, having a pull whole, whole jab in your side. But Christ says your trouble is trouble. What you go through is enough. And because of that, he not only died for you, but he gives you a, 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 a spirit to go along with you, to help you, a comforter, to comfort you in times of trouble. See, God can easily say, you ain't gone through nothing yet. My mom did that. My, my, my mother and father were funny because my dad would say, you ain't done nothing yet. But dad, it really hurt you. Dad, I fell down like that many times. I'm fine. That's what he could say. But God says, no, I understand that. I hear you, and I will comfort you. In Isaiah, he says, I will comfort you as a mother comforts her young. I will comfort you as a mother comforts her young. That's his love for you. So in that truth, he gives you an advocate, a comforter. So when you go through trouble, you have it. So please, church, call on that comforter. He's right there We're waiting for you. It's the promise of God that you have it. You know you have it because you see him now. Whereas in the world, if you, before you knew God, you didn't see. You didn't know it was there. But now you have it. All right. And our third one, what do you have with Jesus? Jesus is the only way to heaven. Come on. We know this, right? Because what's his word say? Yeah, his word says in 14.1, in my father's house there are many rooms. I, I like mansions. I like the mansions one. I, I, let me just say, let's say mansions right now. So in my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not true, I would not have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Wait, he's doing the work again? He's leaving me a comforter that he may go and prepare a place for me. My wife can make a nice, beautiful house. She, you know, she, she, she'll make this nice, beautiful house for me, and I'll come in the house, and I'll look for the refrigerator. But the bottom line is, she's made a beautiful home for me. This is what the Lord is doing for us. He's going before us to make this beautiful place. And then he says, I'm coming back to get you, that you may be where I am. Ah, oh, it's made me cry. My wife says, I said, I do too much. I always feel like God does too much. Amen. Not, 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 not in a bad way. I say it's amazing because God's doing everything for us. My job is to just believe and then to tell the world all this great news I'm giving you right now. This is great news. Tell the world about this because it's so awesome. No. We are, in, let's be realistic, we are kind of lazy as people. And with all this new technology, we're getting laser and laser. I can't make a computer work to save my life, but, but still, I'm, I like to sit down instead of stand up sometimes. The older I get, the more I want to sit down. And Christ is doing everything for me. The word says, believe and be saved. That seems too easy. Because, you know, when I was a kid, there was always punishments. When I did something wrong, I was punished for it. I, I broke into a house. No, I did. I did. No, I did this. I did this. I, I broke into a neighbor's house. God, I can't believe I'm still alive. I broke into a neighbor's house when they went out of town. Now, these neighbors were fantastic people. They paid me $10 to clean their pool every Saturday. They were fantastic people. They did nothing but love me like a second son. And I broke into the house where they were gone, and I, and I took the boomerang that their son had on the wall because I liked it. And I took it outside, and I threw it, and I came back, and it hit me in the head, <laughs> knocked me out, and it broke. My sister comes down the hill, and she sees me knocked out on the, on, on the, on the grass in the front of their house, and she goes, ha, ha! <laughs> and I wake up, I'm like, what, what, what? You did something. And she says, no, you broke that, and that's not yours. That's Mr. What's-His-Name's. 
And I said, oh, no. If I was a movie, I'd look at the camera right now and I'd go, uh-oh. <laughs> because I'm busted. I'm caught in my own mess. She told on me. And my father got angry. And, and, and I went back. And they went to the house. And my father was the chief probation officer for the county at that time. So I had never gotten any real trouble. I would get pulled over by the police. It, it, it was funny because I get pulled over by the police and they'd say, look, kid, you know you ran this light. Let me get your license, your registration. And I get it for him. And then he'd go, you Carl Hopkins, kid? And I'd go, yeah. They go, okay, give me a minute. I'm like, Don't call my dad, I'll die. He killed me. <laughs> they go to the car. And they open the door, they sit down in the car, they say, Mr. Hopkins, you have your son here. And he goes, uh-huh. I say, so he ran a red light. And uh, he said it was orange, but he ran a red light. And um, what do we do with him? Cuff him. Take him away. <laughs> and I was sitting there in the car just like, oh, my God, this is terrible. And the officer would come back and he'd go, all right, so my dad, your dad wants me to arrest you and put you in jail tonight. I was like, I knew it. You should have called it. He says, I'll tell you what. I'll, get, I'll let you go with a warning because I don't want to arrest you because you're who your father is. That doesn't look good, so go on home. And I'd go home. My father would be like, okay, so what's the whipping for now? And I literally am a grown-up. I'm 17 years old, and my dad was whip my butt. Anyway, the point that I make with that is because of who my father was, they gave me a lot of breaks. But in this situation, my father had enough. Now, now of course, I was eight, nine years old when this happened. And how I broke in the house is the door was unlocked. They, they had a door in the back, and it, it was always open, but it was a really old house, so they never thought about it. They live in a rich neighborhood where no one would rob them, except me. And I didn't go in there with the, with the, with the, with the intent to rob them. I went into the house to, to get a toy to play with, because I was wanting to play with toys. And, and, and so that is thievery. That is breaking and entering. That is robbery. So my father says, okay, he, he gets me in the car after apologizing to the neighbors. Neighbors don't want to press charges. They don't want to do anything. They just want to love me. Puts me in the car, drives me to the, to, okay, now, he drives me to, the, to, the, um, to the juvenile hall where he works. His office is upstairs. He's the boss. Drives me there and says, okay, put him in the worst possible room we got. And I went in this room. I don't want to tell you how bad it was. Smelling like urine. It was a terrible room. And I'm like, huh, this is terrible. Ah! And he goes, okay, give him two hours. And my father walked away. And I, I know he was always in the building, but I'm literally, I am incarcerated. And I don't know what that means. I don't know what it looks like, but here I am. And they didn't give me the orange jumper. They gave me a black and white one. And I'm sitting right here. Is this real? I look like a hamburglar. And I'm sitting in there, and, and I'm scared. I, I, I'm a, a well-to-do kid that's never been in really any trouble. My father takes me down there and puts me in the place. And I am just sitting there, and I don't know what to do. And the toilet is dirty, and it's right in front of me. And I'm thinking, I don't want to go to the bathroom. And that, it looks nasty. I don't know any better. And so finally, they come with this food, and it looks like dog food. It is actually tuna, and it's just a tuna can turned over, and it's just tuna. And my father's laughing because he knows I want mayonnaise on my tuna, and I want a little bit of mustard, and I want, a, and I want two white pieces of bread with the crust cut off. He knows this. And I get this one thing in tuna, tuna and I'm like, oh, oh, no. And I said, can I get some mayonnaise? And the guy said, look, man, you want all that fancy stuff. You want mayonnaise in it. You, want all that. you don't get that here. You ain't a guest here. You're stuck here. You'll be here a long time, but you better get used to that there tuna. You enjoy it. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm just crying and crying. Finally, my dad comes in, and he goes, so, you going to stay here? No. Can I bring anybody's house anymore? No. All right, let's go home. Taught me the lesson. And I know how hard it was for him because when we got home, he went to my, he pulled my mother in the back room and I heard him crying like a baby because of what he had to do. He cried because he never wanted to see his son in a situation like that. He said, I've worked years to do this so my kids wouldn't be here. And my son needed this. And I hate that I had to put him through it. And my mother loved on him and gave him, gave him encouragement because he'd done the right thing. Why? I never did it again. That toilet still scares me to this day. I do have tuna still, but I put the man, I put the man in there and I put all the stuff in there. And I thank God that I don't have to eat the stuff that they were giving me. My father said that was mackerel. That wasn't even, it was mackerel. Well, that's not bad, but I didn't know what mackerel was. Anyway, to go through the tough time was so necessary. This is what God does. 
This is how God works. And I'm thankful because I could have had a life of crime. I was terrible at it, but I could have had a, you know, I, I could have literally been a statistic that's still in jail even today for whatever foolish thing I'd done. But my father said, no, I'm going to show, I'm going to cut this off right here at the end. And it broke his heart to do it, but he did it for me. And I know you parents have probably been there before. You probably had to do things like that. You think of all the times you shed tears over your own kids. Thank you. Thank you for that. Because we don't know till now how important that was for us. We don't get it. But how's the, blessed, the biggest blessing, though, with God is they will get it at some point. They may hate you, but they'll get it. Hallelujah. All right. So last point on this is, of course, that, of course, the way is through the son to the father. One more story for you. My mother used to make these great pancakes. Now, they were called hoe cakes, but my mother would never tell me that because I was a kid. These were pancakes with crispy sides on them. They were cooked in oil. Now, obviously, it's just, for us, it's like, oh, my gosh, but they're the best tasting things in the world. She made them every Saturday for me as a kid growing up. That's how awesome my mother was. She'd make these for me every Saturday, and they tasted like heaven. You know, they, they have, they're the pancakes with, with, the, with the big crispy sides on them, and they have the, the, the cornmeal in it. Oh, they're so, so, so amazing. They're, they're a southern dish, and they're called whole cakes, but my mother wouldn't tell me. So I would tell my friends at school about them. Oh, I had these pancakes this weekend. They were so good. You would love these things. So all of a sudden, three friends would show up. I'd show up on Friday night with three friends. Jeff would come over, and, and, and John would come over, and Mount would come over, and they would all come over for the pancakes. They'd come the night before and we'd be, okay, we're going to sleep over. And I'd say, Mom, the guy's sleeping over. We're going to have pancakes in the morning. And Mother would be like, oh, man, okay. And then the next week, it would be, it would be Frank and, and, and John and all these other guys would come over. And sometimes a couple more friends that came from the week before would come over. I'd have that house full of guys. Oh, what these pancakes? And the girls would be mad because they wanted them too. But then you're a girl. You can't hang out with me. I'm, you're, you're a girl. Yuck. But we would have them every week. I would keep bringing these pancakes. And the reason why I bring that up is because... Christ is doing that for us. He's preparing a place for us. He, 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 without Christ, you don't have the home. Without Christ, you don't have heaven. Without Christ, you don't have the pancakes. I want the pancakes, doggone it. I want the good, crispy-sided pancakes. And when I was a kid, I loved those things. My friends loved them, too. And they'd come over and eat those things all the time. My poor mother had her work cut out for her. She had one boy, one girl. All of a sudden, she's got six boys and 12 girls. It's like, all of a sudden, well, how do all these kids? I want that for us. I want that for heaven. I want us to tell so many people about these amazing things that Christ has done for us that would bring thousands and thousands of people with us. On the day when Christ comes to the right hand of the Father, I want you guys to all say, see, I told you, this is what I was talking about. This is it. Look at Christ. Look at him go. See, there he is, right there. Didn't we talk about this? I want you guys to use, to, to, to not lose sight on that. Be firm in the fact that you know who Christ is. He is yours. You are his, and you want to bring the rest of the world with you. Don't just keep this to yourself. This is great news. It's like those pancakes. I want the world to know that we have them. Try these pancakes. Everybody shows up. Let me pray with you. Father God, I thank you that you are the only way. I thank you, Lord, that you stood firm to the end. I thank you, Father God, that you did what no one else could do. And Father God, I, I, I live in a world where... There's always a punishment for what I've done wrong. But Lord God, you died on the cross. You took the punishment for me. That I may have the ultimate gift and the ultimate prize. That's heaven. That is, a, that is what your love is for me. And I thank you for that love, Lord God. I thank you and pray the world will have that love. They will get that love. They will receive that love, Lord God. Because not only have you done the work for us, Lord God, we still have something we need to do. That is to accept you as our Lord and Savior and celebrate you. Be excited about you, Lord God. I say come to church so that we can celebrate with these people. Give us the ability, Lord God, to welcome more into the nest and the blessing and, and give them strength, Lord God, and peace and name in Jesus. I pray your blessing over them, Lord God. I pray your blessing over us. And I pray that many will come to know you because they know this truth about you. Many will be excited and can't wait to have time with you, Lord God. I pray your blessing over us today in Jesus' name. Thank you and amen.